Mary Pavlik Rosen, Chair of the Frankfurt Plant Board. And with me tonight, I have our two guests, our consultants from Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, Juliette Juliard, Joanne Bachman. Um, next in line, I have our attorney for the board, James Liebman, then uh, board member Steve Mason, and board member Don Hale. Uh, I know Walt Baldwin was very interested in being here, but he's traveling and did not make it back in time. So we'll go with that. Um, I have just a couple introductory remarks. First, um, today is actually my father's 96th birthday. Wow. Well, uh, Good for him. A good genius. I should add he did pass away two years ago. But he was, I still recognize July 16th as a special day. And why I'm mentioning him as well is that um, his father was an immigrant to this country. He came here to farm in Ohio, in Youngstown. He um, wasn't very successful in that. He lost two farms during the Depression. The family had to move into town and live on assistance, so welfare. And my father, um, I think that affected him. He was very cost conscious and I think ahead of his time in terms of, in terms of energy efficiency. He built a house that he painted on the north and east side in a light gray and, I'm sorry, a dark gray, and the west and south side in a lighter gray to reflect heat and absorb heat during the different times of year. He put in insulation in eaves in the attic before people were doing that. This was when fuel oil was 29 cents a cubic foot. Um, so he was very interested in that, and he imbued that into his children, especially me. So um, we'll go from there and, and talk about our programs here. I'll hand it over to Juliet. Thank you. And thank you all for coming tonight. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah, good. Um, so as Anna Mary mentioned, we're here to present about the project that we have been hired to do for FPV and that is to um, develop an energy efficiency program plan for Frankfurt. So our team uh, consists of a number of us at VEIC. Myself, I'm the primary contact and project manager on this project. Jonan here um, is our program design lead. Kerry Hoover, who was here with me in May, is our communi communications and stakeholder outreach lead. And we also have Sean Clement, who is a, a municipal utility program Im implementation lead. And we also have a number of, of folks at VEIC who are engineers and uh, program implementers and subject matter experts that assist us in um, designing this energy efficiency plan. And if that works for you all, I will ask you to, um, to keep questions until the end as we go through the slides. And then we'll be more than happy to answer any questions. So just a little bit about us at VEIC. Uh, we are a nonprofit with over 30 years of experience in implementing energy efficiency, but also uh, developing plans. Our mission is to enhance the economic, environmental, and societal benefits of using clean energy and using that energy <coughs> efficiently. Uh, we have worked in over 40 states, um, sorry, over 38 states, six provinces and seven countries in Europe and Asia. We have offices in Burlington, Vermont, where our headquarters is, but also in uh, Ohio, DC, and now Plattsburgh, New York. And we've worked with government agencies, regulators, utilities, foundation businesses, organizations. We, we work with a number of, of different entities. And as I mentioned, we implement energy efficiency programs ourselves, our three main programs are energy, are Efficiency Vermont, which we have implemented for over 18 years in Vermont statewide. We also work in Washington, D.C., where we run the D.C. Um, Sustainable Energy Utility, and we've done that since 2011. And we also, in, um, in Ohio and uh, neighboring states of Delaware, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, we implement energy efficiency for municipal utilities. So in those states, we have an umbrella program that offers a, a pretty wide portfolio of programs to, to a number of municipal utilities, uh, similar in, in size to, to Frankfurt. So we have direct um, implementation experience 
in, in, those, um, in those states. So the Frankfurt Plant Board hired us to, as I mentioned, to um, design energy efficiency programs for, for, the, for the municipal utility, but not, but not to do that in a vacuum, to make sure that we engage the community and hear from community, community members and FUB's customers on what is, is really needed in the community to make sure that the energy efficiency plans meet the community's needs. Uh, so in this, in this um, presentation here, we're going to talk a little bit later about what we heard from you. But first I wanted to uh, invite Jonah to come in and, and talk, tell you a little bit more about what is energy efficiency. Thanks, Juliet. So we hear this word energy efficiency a lot, and it, it, we may or may not understand it. It means a lot of different things to a bunch of different people. And, well, the point we really want to make is that um, energy efficiency allows for the same activities to be accomplished for less energy and lower <coughs> utility bills. So it might be an efficient product that's doing the exact same thing, but it's doing it for using less energy, therefore lower costs. It may be um, insulating your attic so that, again, you're using your air conditioner, but it's it's, be, it's being run at a lower cost and using less energy. So you hear sometimes um, it means turning off the lights or it means um, you know, just not, not using energy. But that's really not the case. That's conservation, it's another word. Um, it's part of the whole picture of trying to save energy. And we, we just wanted to make sure that you, you knew that energy efficiency means that you are not losing you know, any capability, you're still getting your air conditioning and your um, water hot and all that other stuff, but it's being, it's the equipment that's being used <coughs> just uses less energy, and that's why it's energy efficient. And energy efficiency really does have um, tremendous benefits beyond just saving you money, and, and that's sometimes one of the key reasons why energy efficiency has become so important to communities, to individuals, because it's, it's one of these spiraling kind of effects. It, you know, it does lower the utility bills, but it also improves you know, comfort and health and safety in your home. When you have a tighter home, you're just more comfortable, the, you know, the, the air conditioner works better, you can run it at, at, higher, you know, at a higher temperature, but still get the same comfort um, if you choose. There's, um, you know, some, there's no leakages. It, it just gives you a safer situation. Um, it, it increases businesses' productivities and operating costs. Um, businesses have, have seen tremendous <coughs> savings when they put in energy efficiency products, when they try to have a tighter building. It really does make them more competitive. And we've seen, and we're going to share some examples of, of, of how this has helped businesses so that you can kind of see some, some, some specific situations. It does boost the local economy and create jobs. I mean, you've probably heard that different states that you know are really growing in the services area because they've got more contractors out there doing energy efficiency projects and different areas that um, have really seen some additional growth from companies because they're seeing some really positive benefits to being part of those communities. So, you know, there's just a lot of spiraling effects that happen when you start energy efficiency programs. It does reduce the power needed or produced by your utility, so they, they don't have to buy less power. It's contributing to the amount of power needed by just having, you have to buy less power. Um, it reduces peak demand and infrastructure costs. It provides the least expensive source of energy. There is nothing that's um, more cost effective than energy efficiency. It enhances the region's energy independence, and it just overall increases sustainability and reduces environmental impacts. So I wanted to just kind of share a few examples of you know, how this has truly helped communities. So this is an example of, um, and so and these are examples that are from the program that we run in Ohio called um, Efficiency Smart. And these, and, and so, so in that particular case, one of the utilities um, has a customer that is a, a recreational re vehicle manufacturer, and um, 
they wanted to use energy efficiency as a tool to reduce their operating and maintenance costs as um, in order to weather an economic downturn. So it, they were not seeing a, a really a large growth, but they wanted to weather it. They knew things would change. I think it was at the time when um, gas prices were at their highest. People weren't, weren't um, looking to buy recreational vehicles and drive around in RVs because yeah, you know, they were looking at alternative ways for vacations. So um, we had been working with them for quite a while and had done a few minor um, energy efficiency upgrades. And we just kind of kept going on project after project. And so we were able to help them save nearly $500,000 in annual electric costs and more than seven, $735,000 costs over the lifetime. Because if you remember, or if you know this, energy efficiency, once you do it, it's there for life. So it just, the benefits just continue, the lifetime benefits grow and grow because you're you're saving year one, but then you're also saving that year two and anything else. So it just keeps building onto it itself. And what that did was it resulted in the company's financial stability um, so much that they started to um, be building more and more from that plan. So their their headquarters said, you know, you guys are efficient. We're going to have you um, build more of our products in this particular plant. And it caused their one of their one of their distributors or, or suppliers basically to, to move also to, so that they could get closer. So they moved into the same town, and so it created jobs and it really brought in more revenue to the community. So there's again this whole spiraling effects of energy efficiency is what we're trying to really help you all understand today. Um, this is another example of a community benefit, you know, for a small business success. So the goal was to be able to you know, provide the community with energy efficient products, but not drive them to a local retailer in the community. So why not grow the business of someone locally by giving them that opportunity to sell energy efficiency pro pro uh, products, you know, that are maybe, that are incented by the utility. So a small little hardware store in um, Oberlin, Ohio, was supplied with efficient LED light bulbs at a reduced cost. They were able to purchase more than you know, 2,000 bulbs. Um, they sold, the residents purchased more than 2,000 bulbs sold at a very low cost, so the residents benefited. This particular retailer also um, decided that they wanted to stock more products <coughs> because they were starting to get even more foot, foot traffic, so they were growing their revenues. And then they even decided to do an energy efficient upgrade for their lighting in the building where they saved um, $8,400 um, for the year of energy costs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, again, they saved for the, they, they helped the residents save, um, they grew their business, and then they also did an energy efficient upgrade so that they saved money as well. So another one, this is more um, focused on, you know, how communities really want to increase services and really, you know, reduce the burden of energy bills for their most vulnerable populations. And so energy efficiency programs, in this particular case, we partnered with senior centers, food pantries, Meals on Wheels, and um, heat agencies to distribute energy efficient products to hard to reach populations. And this was a way to really allow um, energy upgrades to happen for the most vulnerable at no cost and to help their agencies reach them better because they had a new service to bring to them. And it just, it freed, you know, it was a, a really great opportunity to kind of, you know, just get out there more and support the community, which is a big part of, it, of why um, municipal utilities often do energy efficiency programs. So this is an example about how a, an energy efficient program really specifically helped a residential customer. So, you know, a family whose municipal utility participates in our, you know, efficiency smart program replaced 10 incandescent light bulbs with LEDs and they upgraded their washer and dryer with more efficient models and they were able to save up front through some rebates and some discount lighting and they are expected to save over $1,500 of energy costs for the lifetime of their products. So, you know, again, the good news about pro these products is they last long and it's, and the focus is on lifetime. So the first year, they probably didn't see a whole lot of savings. But 
this is a spiraling effect where you just, you know, over the years you keep getting more and more savings because of something you might have done five years ago. So a small commercial, this is an example of um, a restaurant called The Fev um, in Ohio. And what they decided to do was um, install energy efficiency lighting and then they also installed some more energy efficient refrigeration. And so just their annual savings was um, 73,000, over 73,000 kilowatt hours. They saved over $6,600 of energy and then their lifetime savings, because again, you know, all that savings just keeps growing each year as you keep saving more, is 27,600. So, you know, they found that their payback was less than two years and they're saving a tremendous amount of CO2 reduction. And then the last example that we wanted to share with you is a large industrial customer um, in Wadsworth, Ohio. It's called Acro Mills. And what they do is they make um, both plastic and steel like storage bins. I'm sure if we look around our houses, we probably have some sort of Walmart plastic storage bin that's holding something right now, and that's, that's them. They're not headquartered in Wadsworth, but they have a, a nice plant, and um, the plant was, you know, it installed some energy efficient lighting, lighting controls, and motor control projects. And again, um, they, they saw significant energy savings. They saved a, over almost $200,000 in annual savings costs, and um, just a tremendous amount of, of, of lifetime savings, and their paybacks were two years. And, you know, when we talk to um, many of the industrial <coughs> customers, you know, in all throughout the country, their biggest challenge is that they just don't know how to get started on energy efficient efficiency programs. And what we find is that utilities that start energy efficiency programs, one of the things that, you know, is, is most, it starts first, is offering that support and help and helping these, um, these customers figure out what are projects that we can do. It's, it's not always, I, I can't afford this, it's how do I get started? How do I sell this to management? And that's the biggest advantage of, you know, a community-based energy efficiency program because you can, you know, you can work directly with these <coughs> customers and really help them save. And, and as you saw, their jobs can be created and it really helps the, the whole economy. So back to Juliet. So now after um, we've talked a little bit more about what energy efficiency really is, we, I just want to go a little bit more into the project itself and uh, what we've heard in, uh, during our uh, interviews in May. So, um, so in terms of timeline, the, we started this project in mid-April. We conducted the first round of interviews in, in May. I was here with Kerry Hooper. And we also presented at the board meeting, at the FPB board meeting, um, also in May. Um, now we're back, in, it's July, we're back doing a, a little more community outreach through this meeting and presenting again at the board meeting tomorrow evening. And uh, we have started um, developing recommendations on what programs to incorporate based on what we heard from, from you all in, in town and based on our experience in other places. And our goal is to have a final report and our recommendations presented to the board at the September meeting. So in, uh, when we were here in May, we interviewed over 40 people. Um, we started by interviewing uh, FPB staff and board members to get a good understanding of, of what FPB wanted us, where FPB wanted us to go with this project. We talked <coughs> to uh, residential representatives. We talked to neighborhood associations, um, <coughs> associations that represent low-income customers, um, in Vision Frank Franklin County, local churches, uh, some residents. We also talked to representatives of the institutional and government groups. We talked to the city and county government, state facilities managers, a state energy office, county schools, uh, KSU representatives. So we, we really wanted to have a good understanding of each of the major group of, 
of customers in town and, and what their needs might be. We also talked to some business representatives from uh, the Kentucky Home Builders Association as well as downtown Frankfurt. We uh, talked to two industrial representatives as well. So we, we, we obviously couldn't talk to everyone in town, but we tried to talk to people who, who could represent the interests of different groups um, in town. So what we heard from all those groups is that also, although the, the rates, the electric rates in town are, are low compared to the rest of the nation or even compared to Kentucky, even though the, the rates are low, uh, people find that their energy bills are high. And, and people are looking to save money on their bills. That's something we heard throughout all the different customer groups. And we also heard from several people that there's not a very good understanding uh, for a lot of people between the link um, a good understanding of the link between the actions that people take at home or the equipment they might have at home and the resulting high energy bill. So there's a, there's a strong need for more education in terms of the, uh, the energy bill and why an energy bill might be high and how, how residents of Frankfurt have the power to lower that bill through efficiency. Um, we've heard from the, um, from the community that there's a desire to have audits offered or technical assistance for the, uh, the residential customers but also from the institutional customers, especially the smaller ones and um, governments and business customers. Um, we also lear learned that there might be a, a need for specialized assistance for historical buildings because there are a lot of historical buildings in town. And, um, and also for renters, because about half of Frankfurt, as we understand, are, are renters. So there's, there's a need for the program that we recommend to be available to renters as well. And, and uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, because you can imagine interviewing 40 people, we heard a lot of uh, feedback, but we also heard that financing <coughs> options might be good, whether it's uh, loans or incentives, and that there might be a need for up updating the building codes to to make sure that future building become more energy efficient. So we we heard a, a lot of requests from the community as a whole, whether it's residents or businesses, but there are other constraints that we need to take into <coughs> account. To, to design those energy efficiency programs. Um, I already mentioned the, the lack of understanding of the connection between energy bills and energy consumption. And there is a, there might be a lack of knowledge of what energy efficiency really has to offer in terms of the benefits. So that's something that we want to make sure the programs would, would uh, address. Um, one of the major, um, constraints that exist is the, the funding for an energy efficiency program. Incentive programs obviously require funds to, to provide the incentives and technical assistance programs are also costly to implement. So there need to be um, a source for the funds for, for providing energy efficiency. But we also heard from all the interviews that we did that there's a universal desire to keep the electric rates low. So there's um, so we'll, we'll need to make sure we design programs that are highly cost effective and that would not result um, in a significant rate increase. So there's, there are several aspects that need to be balanced when designing those <coughs> energy efficiency plans. Um, and we want to make sure that the, that the programs don't s start and stop, especially if, if there are technical assistance or audit programs that the, it needs to be offered for, for uh, more than just a year, but for several years in a row to, to be effective. So some of, the, some of the strategies that we're considering in the plans includes providing educational and outreach material, as well as technical assistance for commercial, in, industrial, institutional, and government um, agencies. <coughs> Um, offering incentives for energy efficiency pro products and equipment and working uh, to change B 
behavior to, to result in more, um, more implementation of energy efficiency. And also looking into what loans and financing options uh, would be feasible in Frankfurt. So at this point, we're looking into incorporating this into a plan based on what we heard. And today, we're just providing a really broad overview. But in the, at this point in the process, we're considering all those aspects and, and fitting them into the plan to, um, to provide our recommendations. So with this, I want to open it up to questions and, and hear from you if you have any, any thoughts that you, you care to share. Do you want to facilitate the questions? Sure. I think that might be easier because okay. it might be your, to you as well. So I want to thank everyone for coming again. Um, Lynn, you have look like you have the first question. Yes, uh, when you were mentioning the lifetime savings time, what's the average length? Is that the length of the equipment or the length of the bulbs or what is that? Well, it's the length of whatever the energy efficient okay. product is. So, like an LED bulb, for example, has a ten year life lifetime. So you know the great news, even better news than saving energy, you don't have to change that light bulb for ten full years, and you're also saving energy at the same time. So. So that's what we look at when we do lifetime savings. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we talked about this afternoon was that there are energy star ratings for the light bulbs as well, and that there's the kind of commodity light bulb, and then there's the um, more reliable product. Yeah, the, all LED light bulbs are not made the same. So um, what we find is that when a utility chooses to incent um, put an incentive on a light bulb, they want to make sure that the quality is up there so that, you know, they're, they're looking to really incent more of the energy star light bulbs, not just the baseline um, that are out there. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Andy, go ahead. Um, are you looking at presenting a different programs that the plant board themselves could implement or that or are you also proposing a program that your organization would operate like you operate for um, other utilities in other states? So, I mean, we haven't really gotten that far yet. Um, we think it's important to share a variety of options in this final report. Um, I think that there are, you know, I think we'll, if we look at how energy efficiency programs are implemented, they are sometimes implemented by the utility. They're sometimes implemented completely by an implementer. And then there is some, sometimes a combination of implementation happening where you know, the utility does a lot of outreach and marketing, but then an implementer might you know, do the nuts and bolts of it. So our, our feeling on the final report is that we would be looking at um, expressing all, you know, as many options as we can so that the utility can make the right decision and have enough information to make the best decision. Does that answer? Okay. Yes, Jim, go ahead. Hey. <clears throat> Does the plant board have money in the budget for an energy efficiency program? At this point, we did not vote any money into the budget. It doesn't mean that there isn't money that we could access. So, um, yes and no. Okay. Andy, again, go ahead. Will you be providing the plant board with a cost-benefit analysis of the different programs that you recommend, or will it be more qualitative? Not sure. Um, I think the uh, the cost benefit analysis will be at a higher level if if the if we can get to that level of detail. I don't know if we can. Yeah. We probably can't get to that level of detail at the program level, but we'll we'll be able to provide an estimate a range of an estimate for what we we think the efficiency, the cost effectiveness will be. But it won't be. With the information we have in hand in hand, we can't go to the program level cost effectiveness. I can add a little bit to that. There are some programs that it's easy to say, here's how much it costs to implement it, and here's the benefit, and you can keep track of that and know that the benefit's actually there. And there are other programs that are harder to identify, that they have a concrete dollar value, but they have other aspects that are very positive and supportive. So we'll be talking about all those different aspects when we get closer to defining 
what looks like the best solutions. Joel, you look like you have a question. Well, I'm having a, a little debate in my brain about what the motivation of the plant board is here because it do, is not uh, in the same position that LG&E or KU was and their rationale for offering rebates on appliances and things like that. We have a bulk power purchase thing we're tied into that, so if we reduce residential and industrial demand, the plant board is still on the hook to buy that power or get rid of the excess power that we just saved by tightening up our homes. Um, so I'm concerned about where this process might lead us, um, and I'm interested in um, seeing possibly a discussion of residential PACE programs, because I think if the plant board is in this kind of intermediary role and doesn't have a great mandate to save energy either at institutionally or amongst the customers, that residential pace would allow us as homeowners to implement efficiency and uh, equipment upgrades in a better way in a, in a much larger, uh, larger project sense. So somebody who would never think of installing geothermal might, under residential pace, have the financing where they could do it and also pass, pass on the remainder of the bill to the next person that buys that house. Wow, I think you had about five questions in there. Well, you don't have to answer them, but that's what I'm walking okay. over. But well, if you could speak to kind of the plant board's uh, attitude and approach to calling in VEIC on this, I think that sure. might help some people. Okay. Well, I think I can clarify a couple of things. First, um, the contract that we're looking toward in May, May of 2019, May 1st, is um, to go with KYMEA, and that we have contracts to buy a certain amount of capacity, and that's one charge, and the other charge is how much energy you actually use. So we still have the capacity charge, which is a small percentage. And if we can reduce the amount of energy we're actually purchasing, that's a benefit to us. Now, um, on your question about what's the benefit for the plant board to do this, um, the plant board is a municipal utility, and the customers, serving the customers is the primary interest, whereas investor-owned utilities, serving their investors is the primary interest. So the, they work with the Public Service Commission to define what programs are needed to meet consumer requirements and balance that with their goals for their investors. Whereas here um, with the municipal utility, we're trying to serve our customers as a primary goal. Um, and you mentioned PACE a couple times. Is PACE a particular program? Or? Yeah, it's also known as EPAD. And it's a, it's a financing program that allows you to underwrite basically pretty expensive projects. I'm like air conditioner upgrades, okay. roofing, stuff okay. like that. I'm going to have Juliet or Joanne. I'm sorry. Joanne discuss that. Okay. So, you know, we, we absolutely feel that um, there's definitely benefits to having some sort of financing types of programs available. They do take some time to actually get started and get them implemented. So, um, you know, we had envisioned towards, as we propose our you know, our final recommendations, there will be multiple phases that you would look at when you install, when you work with energy efficiency programs, and that may be more like in a, like a future type of phase, just because the, the purpose of when you start energy efficiency programs, you want to, you want to have, like, things happen kind of quickly. You want to, you got your momentum going, people are excited about this, you need to be able to start to have them get products quickly, save money, you know, start to have the utility see energy savings, the, the large customers. So you'll look, you'll see um, that you, we try, you try to phase things into that type of, of, um, of situation. Hope that helps. Okay. Would it be more feasible to, like, if you're talking about EPAD or PACE programs, to start with commercial as there, I guess we have the ordinance in place that we would implement that here. And because for businesses that they don't want to carry long-term debt and the ability to finance energy efficiency upgrades and equipment upgrades and all that and not have it attached to their bottom line and you know it's, it's attached mm -hmm. to the property and they pay it that way 
is there a way to you know move it up a little bit so you know maybe the residential comes later but really focus on you know the you know the business side of it first to get it started because I mean I think as we try to be more attractive as a place for businesses to come that would certainly help and as, you know we have a fair number of older buildings that are perhaps not as efficient and you know and then folks struggle I mean we went through this recently with you know Danny pickpacking it was you know, startling the amount of money that he was paying every month in utility bills and something like that could you know very much help a business like that to be profitable yeah I mean it, it's definitely feasible we're we're actually um, trying to watch Louisville right now because they also have the same um, the same ability and they're they seem to be kind of just starting to promote it and so you know the key is you want to know that there would be really uptake in something like that because nothing involving financing is easy to implement so it's important to find out before you implement something like that you know is there interest you know will people if you provide it will they come basically and so that I think there need to be more work on that because I have seen Many states put, you know, commercial pace in place, put residential pace in place, and just not seen uptake. You know, there's, I've seen more successful programs that have come out of credit unions where, you know, uh, utilities do buy, that, buy downs of interest and credit unions provide a 10-year lease and a 10-year um, term, and that's been positive. So I think what we have to do is as we get deeper into um, the community and whether, you know, once we get to the past that, yes, let's implement energy efficiency, we would want to really look at what's best for the community, what makes the most sense. And it is great that, you know, we do have EPAD already approved for, uh, for Frankfurt, so that's wonderful. Yes, um, Jim again. Good. Do you have other Kentucky municipal utilities as clients, and if so, what type of programs have they adopted? We don't have them as clients, but we, we keep an eye on what kind of programs they are offering. I noticed Bowling Green got a mention in one of the slides. Bowling Green, Ohio. It's Bowling Green, Ohio, yes. Yeah, Ohio's been really the area that we've had more success in the Midwest from a municipal utility perspective. We do work with many of the larger utilities in the surrounding states, but you know, Kentucky has had its, like policies are not really, there's not a lot of great policies available right now for really pushing this. So um, you guys would be pioneers. I'd have to, I, you know, you'd be, you would really, I think it would really draw a lot of interest in what you're doing here because there's not a lot going on in Frankfurt. You know, you wouldn't be one of, you'd be one of a few, not one of a m many like the Northeast is, to be honest. One of the interesting things that came out of our conversations this afternoon and preparing things is that Florida has seen an influx of a lot of people coming from the north and moving to, we talked about Jacksonville, and that there actually are new residents down there requesting programs based on their knowledge of other places. So that's, that was an interesting comment there. And um, Eric, I, I know that, um, Eric Wisman, I know that you have some experience with historic buildings and um, I've talked to some businesses downtown that have single pane windows and how they were affected by this past winter. Do you see any um, ideas for how to deal with those things and, utilizing historic buildings for businesses. The EPAD that we mentioned, I think, was possibly one of the best programs I know of that, to make the efficiency upgrades. Um, regular insulation, what is it, something like 10% of your energy loss is actually out the vertical walls of your, your buildings through your windows. Yeah. And uh, we did a national study in Kentucky just a couple of years ago that showed Changing to um, insulated glass does little to nothing, but a properly restored window is, um, we, we did some great steel windows that, that used to be on the school over here, that a <coughs> properly restored steel window was um, more energy efficient and more economical than a brand new vinyl window that was mm. really eye-opening. So um, mostly just creating upgrades, usually older buildings are so dense anyway, uh, basement buildings particularly. 
that the, uh, the energy changes are slower in those buildings that once you keep a constant uh, system, if you can put a high velocity or a high efficiency system into those buildings, they, they tend to function better. Um, of course, your older frame buildings, it's just a matter of properly insulating and sealing gaps and making those uh, less air and less air infiltration to those. But, um, Was there a report actually published that would be on the internet? There is. It's a National Windows Standards Collaborative. You can look it up yeah. online, Google it. It's published. It's about a 400-page report that was done at Pine Mountain Settlement School here in Kentucky wow. by um, a, a national, by a team of experts that are, are sort of national experts in restoration and, and window restoration. There is some of those <coughs> here. There is some of those here. Patrick Kennedy. Patrick was part of that. Patrick Kennedy. Um, okay. John. Teachers uh, that are at the uh, school in Louisville Preservation, a school that's under transition into a new name. I'm one of them. I can't think of his last name, but there's John. John Roger does. Rogers. Rogers. You no. Know, okay. He does a lot of well, renovation at Liberty Hall. I think um, looking up that report will probably explain that. That that would fit into some okay. of our conversations this afternoon. So it's good. Just basic maintenance more than anything. Um, prove more beneficial than anything else. Okay. Well, my husband and I have an older home and we're doing tech pointing, which is, we just go from maintenance project to maintenance project, so <laughs> it's important. <laughs> so, um, board members, do you have any questions that we'll be discussing energy efficiency tomorrow in the regular meeting, but if you have anything for now, that, that'd be good? Nothing. Okay. And is this just, are we just talking about electricity now, or are we also going to be talking about water conservation? Well, um, we can talk about water conservation as it ties into efficiency. So, um, I don't know that, that, is that what I you mean, want? the scope of the project has really been very focused on electric, it is. electric energy. But, but, it, but there's definitely ways to tie them both, you know, through education, through some of the outreach. You know, they make energy efficiency kits that are water and electricity focused. So it would really depend. I mean, uh, we haven't learned as much about, you know, any water constraints, high water costs. So, um, you know, I'm sure we'll be continuing to learn that. From the board. Got a question for you. Um, okay, go I'm ahead. The, an idea that I had years ago, and I missed the vote on it, but um, turbines in your water lines, electric turbines. Um, have you seen much use of those and any returns on? You've got water flowing anyway that they can produce uh, energy in your your home and small systems or larger commercial systems. Um, since we are a, a larger water provider for this area, is that something that could be possible? I don't have much knowledge. Like. Yeah, I'm not familiar with them, but the, the water has to be pumped to your house to start with. I mean, it has to be pumped to a reservoir and then it probably goes downhill. So I think, cause there, I think it really depends on how your water infrastructure is built and whether the water going to your house is being pumped or if it's gravity fed. If it's being pumped, then by adding a turbine in there, you, you taking energy away from the, I mean, you're adding more load to the pumps, so I, I think it really ne needs to depend on how your water infrastructure is built. Is that something we could look at with our new reservoir? Is it pumped to it and then gravity fed away from it? Well, um, possibly. That's an area that um, I haven't really looked into. I think the amount of drop would make the biggest difference. So I'm, I'm not sure if, if we have that, but it's something we can look into. Um, oh, good. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but I, go ahead. I, I noticed the word code enforcement listed somewhere in this. Oh, uh, building code enforcement, yeah. Uh, could you, uh, and as somebody who has multiple properties, I'm always interested in code enforcement, mm -hmm. but could you, could you give us a sense of the types of recommendations that are made to cities or communities of uh, adjustments in their code enforcements that maybe have been recommended to them to implement um, that have to do with energy efficiency? So I think you're saying not only enforcement, but also new codes that would help with energy <coughs> efficiency? So I, I, I just saw those words okay. up there. Okay, well, I, we'll expound on that. Thank you. Don't do the first I mean, I'll, I'll well, building codes, right. Yeah. right. Okay. Well, yeah. But the codes come first and the enforcement comes there. Right. 
Uh, right, so I think the building code is at the statewide level at this point. I mean, there could be um, there could be a way for the town to have a bylaw, probably to have a stricter code in town. But in my experience, the uh, the building code is mostly enforced during construction of new new buildings, and Frankfurt doesn't have uh, much growth at this point. So at, at we wouldn't necessarily um, make that a top priority. But if there was more growth in town, it would be worth uh, for the town to look into having more stringent energy codes so that the new buildings built would be more energy efficient. Yeah, just, um, just to kind of explain. So under building code, there's a whole section of energy codes. And, and they, they really do apply <coughs> much more to whether it's a brand new building being built or you're doing a, you know, a massive, what they call a, a deep retrofit, where you're pretty much almost tearing it you know, down and kind of starting all over. So that's where it, it becomes the most effective when you've got like a, a lot of new growth, basically, and not a lot of new buildings getting built. So uh, Brent, I know you're here, and you always have good questions. Is there anything you've thought of? <laughs> Well, I just, well, I don't know if I have a question, but a thought that just popped in my mind. Good. You were talking about the building codes. You mentioned that 50% of our residents are rentals. Could there be something that's built into our building inspection and requirements that rentals have to at least have their attics properly insulated at some level? Since so many of our houses are, our rental houses are in old, older buildings, probably they didn't have those requirements to work with. Well, that, that's a good point. I know um, Austin, Texas, where I, my former home, that now um, when they advertise and rent a place, they have to list both the average utility bill and how much they're charging for rent so that you can compare it a shot as an entire you know, investment in moving there. And something like that is uh, something that could be considered. I thought they also um, had to do an energy audit. Oh, too. Could be, did I, I, I thought that was their their latest. I mean, Austin, Texas is, is unbelievable. There's not probably another, and it's a, and it's a municipal utility that does all this. But um, they, I believe that they actually before you can re-rent it to a new auditor uh, to a new customer, you actually have to get an energy audit done. The building owner has to get an energy audit done. So they have so that the there's full disclosure, you know, for whoever purchase whoever rents this property, they know what's going on here. So which is not the case in so many situations. You come in and the next day their refrigerator breaks or there's, you know, leaks everywhere. So I, I think that's really interesting. And they did build it into their more like their town ordinance. I don't even think it's the building code. I think it's just the fact that, you know, it's the relationship between the utility and the the town um, is just amazing, and they they really they want to see change, and they're they're making it. They're they present at every conference, and it, it, they're doing some really creative things. So that's one way that a community handled it. Um, there could be other ways too, like as you mentioned, the <coughs> building audit. Yes, Connie, go ahead. One thing, more of a comment, but one thing that was exciting when you said that we could be one of the leaders, first in leaders to do mm -hmm. that. I mean, that's really exciting because here in Frankfurt right now, I mean, we just thought about rebranding and created our new logo, and we're just thinking about how we talk about our community and just the idea that we could do neat things and be invited to national conferences all over the country and get to talk about Frankfurt. I just think that's a really exciting opportunity. So I just wanted to thank the plant board for um, reaching out to BEIC and making this happen. So thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. And it was interesting when I, I went to the Friday night concert and talked to various people. We we're standing around talking to other people about things. I, I just brought up energy efficiency and talked to them a little bit. Some people were um, somewhat envious of KU and um, the programs that they have had, which um, KU is now going away from those programs. Um, they went to Some the PSC and said, we've done this long enough, and they're migrating away from those, keeping uh, low-income programs and business programs. But um, that it's an area that we've never really explored. I think about 10 years ago, there were some projects that were done, but it kind of fizzled out, and so this is a new look and a new effort to see what, what we can put together. 
Yes, go ahead, How Christina. How does KSU profit from reversing Okay, I don't think you mean Kentucky State. I think you mean um, the utility. uh, Kentucky yes. Utilities. Um, well, I'm not sure how to answer that. What's so, the um, how does KU Kentucky Utilities how do they profit by reversing their emphasis on residential energy efficiency? So, I mean, my understanding, you know, is that when you're with investor-owned utilities, which are the regulated utilities. Um, they want to get reimbursed for the fact that they are losing ele electricity. So they're, I mean, they're losing customers being able to pay for electricity. So energy efficiency is actually, you know, when you think about it, it's counterintuitive to a for-profit utility because they want to sell as much electricity as they possibly can. So they're able to recoup this um, this money back that they're losing by not being able to sell energy. And so my understanding is why they're probably cutting some of their programs is they were told that they can't recoup as much. And so they're not going to do it for free. They're all about their investors. They're a public company. They need to show bottom line profit. And then they, they made a decision that where they want to spend their money is probably where they're going to get the most savings, which are the, the businesses and the larger industrial. And then from a, you know, from a good, goodwill perspective, they probably felt that, you know, the vulnerable population was where they wanted to, to focus next. So it's a business. Yes, Eric, go ahead. Yeah. Going along with the, our local rental inspections, the energy um, audits every few years. I love that. Um, any potential for you to provide some maybe community ideas that we can do outside of the plant board's purview for uh, efficiency things? I'm, I'm imagining you know, coating flat roofs to be white instead of black, uh, parking lots that could be coated in that, that new white uh, surface. surface. Um, maybe suggestions for tree canopy on certain size parcels, things that can go beyond the plant force purview, but, but may tie in somehow. Is, is any of that hmm, that's a good question. part of the study? Uh, it, it's outside the scope of this study, but there's the EPA has some good resource on uh, reducing the heat island effect. So if you go on their website, <coughs> you, can, you can find some information on, on that, on green, green roofs and uh, cool roofs and um, impermeable pavements, that kind of thing. Um, or clear, um, light colored pavement. What the the um, EPA, the, the EPA they have a heat island focus to help communities reduce the, the heat island. That, so the heat island is when cities are warmer than the, the, the surroundings because of buildings and, and black surfaces. So that's, they present ways to reduce the, that warm, warming effect in, in cities. But in terms of other initiatives that communities could take, there's also a toolkit that's coming out soon, a policy toolkit to help communities implement um, energy disclosure policies. So what we're talking about for Austin, about uh, putting policies out there at the community level to, to require um, real estate sales to disclose how much energy the, the building was using. So there, it's coming up soon, and that when I do have the location for that toolkit, I will share with the with FPB. But it, it will provide some <coughs> information on how you can write policies to, to uh, support that kind of, um, of programs. I just have one more thing to add. I mean, there's definitely, the key is when the utilities are collaborating with the cities. I mean, that, that's just really critical. And there, you know, there are a bunch of different states. Uh, Missouri's probably the closest one that I can think of that's um, really looking at trying to include in the MLS, which is the real estate um, listing for your home, you know, if you did do an energy efficient improvement, you know, to kind of highlight that and to start to really show the value of energy efficiency to people buying it and, 
you know, it, it, it can bring in more money or just differentiate you from the competition, if, especially if there's extra houses. So I know more and more states are starting to build some of that in so that you can show your, the work that you did do. I just wanted to add one more comment. Juliet, when you mentioned um, the toolbox, that would be something that you'd find on the internet that's an I a group of ideas? Yeah, it will be on the NASIO's website, so it will be public. Okay, NASIO as in? Uh, um, it's the National Association for State Energy Offices, so it's naseo.org. Okay, good point. Um, that may be something that we could have a link to on our website, yeah. the FTB website. The other thing that um, your question, Eric, made me think of was education and um, informing people how they can make logical choices um, in terms of using energy. Um, we talked a little bit about peak energy usage and to, you know, if it's something that you could do um, when the, it isn't a peak time period, which is changing. It used to be 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a business day, and now it's becoming more evenings. So running your dishwasher after midnight if you stay up that late, or um, trying to distribute the, the energy load. But just education as a major portion of energy efficiency. Please go ahead with your question. I really didn't have a question. I had oh, a comment. Good. Mm -hmm. um, I used to own a home in uh, Moreland, and it was heated with the electric cables in the ceiling because it was a fairly new home in a new subdivision. And uh, the builder that built the house <coughs> did a very nice job of insulating it. And I was talking with a neighbor who lived across the street whose house was built approximately the same time as mine. I was astounded to find that my energy bill was half of what his was. And so I do think that considering some upgrading of codes, although maybe we don't, aren't building as much right now, would really set the city for future growth. Okay. That's a great thing. Yeah. You know, that does come from the, half, the city, though. That half, half of what my neighbor right. was paying. Half. <coughs> well, we do have elections coming up, so right. it might be something city. when these candidates come to your house and talk to you about, I'm running, mm -hmm. what things concern you, it's something you could bring up. Oh. Patricia, one of our candidates. Um, well, I was wondering, in between the building that's being built now, the state building, where the tower was broke down, and this would be probably a Frankfurt plan for question, is there going, can we have any numbers on when that building, because I heard it was supposed to be energy sufficient, so on the numbers compared to the Merrill building and the new building going up, a lot of people like to see numbers when you say energy sufficient, and it's good to use other states, but a lot of people like to say, okay, well, if Frankfurt Plain Board's running that building, we want to know what the numbers are in an energy sufficient building versus what Merrill Street was doing, the tower. Because um, I was working on a grant, the NSF export grant with the University of Kentucky, and we bought, and we built a building right next to the same building, which was energy sufficient from the windows um, to everything in the building. And I could walk in and just touch a computer, and it could tell me what the old building was doing right now as far as, um, the energy being used in the new building and how efficient the new building we built was with the NSF F score. Um, and I know that we could probably use that as well in, in a lot of research. Uh, when I was there, we did tons of research across Kentucky uh, through F score, which is an energy requirement. Well, the only thing I've heard on that is that new building, I believe, is supposed to be LEED certified silver. Oh, and cool. I haven't heard beyond that. Do either of you have comments? No, I mean, that, that would be great. I mean, you know, LEED cert certified has different levels. Platinum is the highest, and silver is next. And I mean, that's a great building. So if you, if you can be convincing builders to build to LEED that are going to start brand new buildings, you know, you're, you're doing a great job with that. So that's good. Yeah, and I guess I don't have any other ideas on the things that were demonstrated about the new building versus the old yeah. building, but it's a good goal. Like comments too that in Danville they built a new senior citizens building probably 10 20 years ago now and the architect who designed the building 
designed it so that in the winter time, most of the time, they could use the lighting in the building to heat the building. Okay. It was insulated that well. Well, good points, what, what building codes can do. So, um, I notice Mayor May is here. Um, Bill, would you like to say anything on energy efficiency? Um, no, any uh, comments? Just to follow up, I think it was 12 years ago, we put together a task force to deal with energy efficiency and climate change issues. And we had it working. We, we adopted most of those recommendations, except for maybe one or two small ones. I think it's great to be talking about it again. Um, is welcome both on the commission or candidates who, who think that's important because it's certainly important to us. And one of the ways you can save people for their pocketbook is to have energy efficient um, discussions, teach people how to, to be more energy efficient and have the audits kind of their homes. So I think we did a few of those. I don't know if there's still um, some people still interested in that or not. I mean, we, we had that going and things changed. Uh, Administrations changed after I left, and it got, it got stopped. Um, I'm not saying anything's not true. Okay. Well, um, one significant there, there were some significant recommendations we made that, that didn't get through, which was in particular we recommended hiring a sustainability coordinator through the city to try to coordinate programs in an integrated way, um, and the commission didn't did not okay. approve that. That was the biggest thing we did. And uh, we've talked about it a few times since. Well, thanks, Jim. We probably can't get that, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. Keep trying. Okay. So good. Not to be political. I don't, I don't do politics. I do government. And <laughs> That's a good one. I like okay. that. Good it's important. Um, it doesn't matter if Democrat or Republican. If you can save money, it's always a good thing. Yep. Yep. Good statement. And something. Well, but it's not Democrat or Republican. Same thing. Okay. Good. Let's see, do we have any other questions or comments? I'm American, does that count? <laughs> well, it doesn't really per pertain to energy efficiency okay. at this time. I mean, I'm just for energy efficiency. Okay. Oh, okay, good. I don't care. <laughs> okay, that's good. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, I guess. Thank you.